I want you to open them to two passages at one time. I want you to open them to the little epistle of James. That's right there just before you get to 1 Peter uh, in the New Testament. Open it to chapter 5 and you're going to look at verse uh, 17. And then our uh, teaching this morning is going to be from... from um, 1 Kings um, chapter 16. So you want to open them up there. I'll be finding that place uh, this morning. Uh, it's the seventh thing we try to do here on the, on the, um, in teaching the Bible. We want to be faithful to the Word of God. We want to make certain that this movement of CCDA is, is anchored in the Word of God and what we really believe that Christian community development is all about is putting into practice the teaching of Jesus and the teaching of Scripture and to really apply the Scripture as it was meant to be applied. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper for correction and righteousness, for instruction, so that the people of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good work. That is its purpose. That is its purpose. Inspiration is a byproduct of it. You don't read the Bible to be inspired. You read the Bible with the intention of obeying it. And then the inspiration come out of obedience. Right. Obedience. They carry the joy to suffer shame for his name. They were set on obeying God. And their joy came out of that. Even we don't necessarily seek joy. Joy ought to be a natural flow. Now our joy, our, our joy can be hindered. And that's why we confess our sin so that our joy can continue. So joy ought to be a continued part of the Christian life because the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's where our energy comes from. And so we are here to teach the word and to apply the word uh, to our lives. And that would be Christian community development. Jesus was here. Read the book of Mark. The book of Mark, you will see that Jesus was absolutely busy. Busy. He came not to be served, but to serve. And if you look at those 16 short chapters there, you'll find more miracles. You'll find, he, they don't even have time. Mark don't even have time to give a genealogy. It, it says that when Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, he began to serve. He began to serve. And the Bible says, as he was, so are we in the world. We are here, the church is to be the continuation of Jesus of Nazareth here on earth. We are his body now here on earth. And we are here to carry on his work on earth. And, and so we are here to, to, uh, to study uh, here this morning. So if you have your Bibles open there at James, let me start off here with James because what we want to do here this morning, we want to talk this morning about our vulnerability. Vulnerability. Yesterday we talked about integrity, you know, and that we lifted up then uh, a person of integrity. And that person was Joseph. And we couldn't find anything wrong with Joseph. He was absolutely a person of integrity. And that we used to show Job's, Joseph's life, we used then Psalms 1. And we said that Psalm 1 was a picture of a person who lived out their life like, Je Je like uh, Joseph lived out his life. Blessed is the person that standeth not in the seat of the not, sitteth not in the seat of the comfort, not stand in the way of sinners, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law does they meditate day and night. They'll be like a tree planted by the river of the water that brings forth fruit in the season. The leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever they get involved in will prosper. And then it says the ungodly is not so. But they're like, and that's one of the things that I get to that this morning. I, I'm getting sick all the time of hearing all of these prayers where we are praying for ourselves. The best prayer that we should pray for ourselves should be the confession of our sin so that we might be healed. And once we do that, then our prayers ought to be that his kingdom come, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All of this self-righteous, self praying that God will do all this stuff for me is not in keeping with the scripture. It is God's will is to be done. His kingdom is to come. We're to be praying for others. 
and for others' needs, praying for the broken in society. And then when we are really in trouble, let's get somebody to come pray for us. <laughs> okay. Okay. We are ready this morning for our teaching from the book of James. Listen to what it says here in the book of James. It says uh, in verse 17, Elijah was a man in like passion just like us. Know what this verse would really say here if I was reading it from a version that I would write? It would be James was, Elijah was an ordinarily old Joe just like you and I. He had all of the anxieties and all of the pain. All of, He was a person just like you and me. Elijah was not Bond specialist. We're going to see that this morning. We don't know nothing about his background. We know nothing about his mother and father. Nothing even about the tribe he came from. All we're going to see this morning, this guy is going to appear on the scene. That's all we're going to know about him. He was just an ordinary guy. But he becomes the greatest of all the prophets in the scripture. Well, you see, you're going to say John the Baptist was the greatest. Well, John the Baptist really was a, almost like a reincarnation of, uh, of uh, Elijah. He was like Elijah that was prophesied would come again. And he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So Elijah was the great prophet in the Old Testament. And we're going to see that he was the vulnerable guy this morning as we go. So now let's turn then in our Bible then and let's look at our passage uh, here in Second Kings as we get to our teaching here this morning. In First King, First King, uh, uh, let's look begin at chapter 16 and let's look at verse uh, uh, 30. Let's start at verse 30. Are you there? Okay. First King Verse 16, chapter 16, verse 30. And it says, And Ahab, the son of Omar, did evil in the sight of the Lord, above that all that was for him. This we are looking now at a wicked, wicked, wicked king. I want to give you a background for when this man, Elijah, is going to appear on the scene. When he's going to expose himself. When he's going to become vulnerable. When he's going to take risks. If you're going to be effective for God, you got to live by faith. And you got to take risks. You got to be vulnerable. And we're going to see this guy here. And he's going to appear at the darkest hour in the nation of Israel. And I really believe that we are living in a very, very dark time right now. And we're going to see that. That's why that I really believe the reason that uh, this little CCDA is, uh, is having the impact it's having is because we are living in such a dark, dark period. We are recovering faith and works together. The church had divided itself between some people who did good social work. We call them liberals. And then we had another group that was sort of fundamental evangelicals. They talked about God. And you, they were divided along those lines. Now what we're trying to do is bring faith and works back together. We are trying to bring the evidence of our faith by our good works. And so we are here to do God's work. And I think that's and because this, there's a need out there that people can see. Even now the government is looking to the church, looking to us to do what they have failed to be able to do. Because we're in this dark situation. So let's look now and do our reading here from our, from our passage this morning. Now we meet this guy, uh, Ahab. It says, And Ahab, the son of Omar, did evil in the sight of the Lord, above all that was before him. 
And it came to pass, as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. Now he is the king that really pulled the nation apart really and God had wanted them to be a united nation, a witness before the rest of the nation and he's the king that pulled it apart. And he's the king that did wicked things. He's the king that wouldn't allow the rest of the tribe to go to Jerusalem to worship what God had set up that that was the place where the twelve tribes was to go. He set up a temple and he wouldn't allow the people to go there. He turned the people away from the true and the living God. The one God. And of course the main thing here, the first idea of the commandment is this. The Lord thou God is one. And we're to have no other God before that God. And so this guy, Jeroboam, pulled him away from this God. And now this king come along. And this king now established as the official religion, Baal as God. We're going to see that he's going to marry a Baal princess. And that's going to be Jezebel. And she's going to establish Baal as the official religion. The first commandment, thou shalt have no other God before me. The Lord thy God is one. And him only shall you worship. And now we are moving to the place where this nation, where this king is pulling the people away from God and establishing another God in his place. It is dark. It is dark. Now let's continue here for just a minute here. And he raised up an altar. Uh, no, okay. He, it, right, go back to, go back to uh, 31. And it came to pass it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, that he took a wife of Jezebel, the daughter of the high priest of Baal. You see, he took a daughter of that and, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he raised up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal. And he set it up in the capital in Samaria. And he made other groves to Baal. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the other kings before him. And then it go on to tell how that they went absolutely, they looked in the Bible and they found things that was in the Bible and they made certain that they turned the people absolutely against what the Bible was saying. It's in this dark moment that we're going to meet this guy who's going to expose himself. Who's going to become the a vulnerable guy. We said first that this guy was an, an ordinary Joe just like you and me who's going to become the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. What's going to make the difference? That's where I'm going to. What's going to make the difference? What's going to take an ordinary Joe and make an ordinary Joe an extraordinary? That's what we need to know, isn't it? Let me tell you what happened. Know what happened? Somewhere along the line, this guy fell in love with God. That's the difference. That's all is required for a person to be, well, an ordinary person to become an extraordinary person. The first commandment of God is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then to love the people around you, your neighbors. And then when one will do that, then that person will become extraordinary. You know, Jesus was approached one. And they asked him, what was the commandment? What is the great commandment? What is the Bible all about? What is religion all about? And he said it was this. To 
love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And then he said the circle was like unto it. It's to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what it takes. That's what it takes is to love God. All it requires, all, Jesus taught that if you will love him, God says, he says that I will come be with you and my father will surround you. And you will become powerful if you love God. The question today really is whether or not we love God. That's the big question. Whether or not we have allowed other materials. I meet people today who call themselves going into mission, want to do God's work, want to plant churches, and we can't arrange a budget to satisfy them. They are more concerned about their own self-survival than they're concerned about obeying God. Any person come after me, says Jesus, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's not abandoning of self. That's putting yourself in the hands of a loving God. Amen. Loving God. And all that God wants you to see is the fact that he loves you. That is the message. That is the gospel. The gospel is the love of God made visible. That's what the cross is about. That's why Paul says, for the preaching of the cross are to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God, because it's through the cross we see the love of God. So let's, let's look at this, at this prophet here this morning, and how this love pulled him out and made him a, a, a vulnerable a guy. Let's go to the background. Here this king had done turned the people away from God. And then of course God called this person. And, and God's call on our life is a vision from God. So any leader that's going to be a leader, it starts with a vision. You've got to have a vision. You, you know, and I talk to people who say they're going into God's work. I say to them, I stop and say, explain it to me. Explain it to me. Explain to me. If you can't explain to me, you ain't ready to do God's work. Because God's work begins with a vision. The per when God calls somebody to do something, he gives them a vision. Because without a vision, the people perish. Leadership begins with a vision. And that vision then ought to be for God. And so this man got a vision. He was able to see the situation that his nation was in. And then he comes out of nowhere. I look, go down now to verse 17, chapter 17, and let's meet our example this morning of this vulnerable guy. This guy who is my hero. This guy, e Elijah. Know nothing about him. We know he was a desert person. Uh, we, we know he didn't do anything to try to get a, uh, to reject himself at all. You can look at the kind of food he would eat. You, you, you can look at the way he dressed. He wasn't somebody who, who, who was trying to impress people. And I meet a lot of people today. And I meet a lot of people who are trying to be leaders. They are more concerned about their own image than they are concerned about the things of God. You see, like, let's look at him now. Let's meet this guy. It says, uh, here we meet him. And this is the first time you're going to meet him. And what you see in this verse here is basically what we know about him. Here, we know nothing about him, that he was a desert person. He, he came from the, the, the town of Tishabite. And that's why we call him here uh, a Tishabite. That was the name of the town that he comes from. It says nothing about his tribe. We know nothing about him. We know he was a Hebrew. And here this guy who have fell in love with God appears on the scene. And you're going to see here that he loves God. What, what, he's motivated by God's love. It is God's love that ought to motivate us. What we are doing ought to be in response to the love of God. And look what happens here. That here in verse uh, 1. And Elijah the Tishabite, who was from the inhabitant of Gilead, go out and meets the king. And he confronts the king.
and he says to the king, look what he says to the king. He says, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, now as far as Ahab was concerned, Baal was the main God. And he confronts him as the prophet of God. And he confronts him with the, with the sort of a, a, a madness and sort of an arrogance as he confronts this guy. He said, as the Lord God of Israel live, be home before whom I stand. He said, I am the representative of this God. Now God called you and me to so you our lives in servitude to him that we really be standing in God's place. We are standing. This is what Paul says when he talks about reconciling. He said that we stand in God's place as reconcilers. And so here's this bold man meets this guy who's worshiping Allah and he stands up and say, I serve this living God. I represent this living God. And I'm standing in the place of this living God to this king. Look what happens here now. Here on whom I stand. And then he says to prove to you that I serve the true and the living God. That it's not going to rain, neither no dew going to be on the ground for the next three and a half years. That's pretty bold. That's pretty bold. That could be a death sentence. If any do fall now in the next week, then the king has the right now to kill this guy. To put to death this false prophet. If a guy prophesied something in the Old Testament, the Mosaic law said if that prophecy did not come to pass, then they was to take that person out and stone him. And so he said it boldly. I represent you know today what I find I don't find people today very much who has any sense of cause they're not burdened for nothing they got just enough of God to help them out they got just enough of God to get over but they don't have no calling to anything and this guy comes out he loves God and he just, all the prophets, what made the prophets prophets, that these people was jealous of the righteousness and the holiness of God. All of the prophets have one thing, that this God is holy, and you have turned away from this holy God. And you have substituted other things for this holy God. And so he confronts him here. That's the day what is a well okay, he confronts him he confronts him and we know the story it don't rain in three and a half years and then the Bible said he prayed again and it rained and you know before all of this happened he not only confronts the king but he also then before it rained before it rained he says, I want to have a, a contest with these other prophets. I, I wanted you to bring all the other prophets. And really, it was, it was 800 of the prophets. They didn't bring them all. They brought them about 450. And y'all know the story. They had the contest. Who was served? And this Elijah was bold, man. He said, I'm, I mean, he was vulnerable. He's vulnerable. He, he said, we're going to see the God who is the true and the living God. This God speaks by fire. And let's have a contest. And so he brought all the prophets together. And he, he, he laid down some rules. And he said, you, you kill an a animal, put him on there, and you pray for rain. And so they put it on there. It was a contest. All the folk, the people came out. Yeah, I mean, it was a carnival. Uh, the people came. They came to see. And most of them thought, really, that, that, that Baal was going to win. Uh, because they had believed in Baal. They had turned away from God. And they came there to see Baal put this one little old hairy prophet to death. And so he, they 
he had the contest. He told them, he left the rules, put it down there, and, and told them to, to, to pray. And boy, they started praying. They started praying. They prayed for the noontime. Nothing happened. They started dancing, dancing, and they started, they started cutting themselves, and they was crying out, oh Baal, oh Baal, oh Baal, uh, send, some, send some fire. No fire came. And I like uh, Elijah, he was a joker, you know. <laughs> e e Elijah, you, you, you see, while he was tough, he was a joy for God. I mean, e Elijah would make jokes. He wasn't no long-faced cyber guy. You know, he, they got there doing it. He said, uh, keep on going, guys. Uh, uh, your, your God might be on a vacation. And, 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 he, and he said, tell you yet, he, he, he might be asleep. You know, the Psalms have that so beautiful. He said, the God that we serve neither slumbers nor sleep. And he went to joking with him. Your God must be asleep. He's going on vacation. Something's going wrong with your God. And so he mocked them. And then it came time for the evening sacrifice. And he's doing it according to the word of God. If we're going to do things, we've got to do it according to the word of God. And so what he did then was, he gathered together 12 stones, and those 12 stones, that was an old altar that had been built there. And he regathered those 12 stones, put them together, put the altar there. Then he happened to kill the sacrifice and put it on there. And then he built some trenches around it. Yeah. So it can hold water. And then he dumped water on there. More water on there. Soaked the water on there. And then he just quietly, quietly called upon the Lord. Yes. And when he called upon the Lord, fire came down from heaven and consumed him. And then, of course, he took care of the other false prophets. <laughs> And then by this time, God now is over. The game is over. This, they know now. They've been able to demonstrate who is the true and living God. And then the cloud began to circle in the sky. You know that story. It's a Sunday school story. But let me tell you this. This is important here. Uh, this guy had confronted the king and had told the king, you know, time and time again he confronted him. Another time he confronted the king while they were looking for water. Y'all remember that? And when he found him, he said, uh, Oh, you are my enemy. And Elijah said, I'm not your enemy. He said, You are enemy of God because you have turned the people away from God. And I'm here to turn the people back to God. Now that was the work of the prophet. That's our work. The work that Elijah came to do, the Bible says it in the Gospel of Luke. It says what he was to do there, he was to turn the fathers back to the children. If you want to know the problem we have today, is that the fathers have left the children. And his job was to turn the fathers back to the children. He was to bring responsibility back to the home. That was his task. That's our task. Uh, if all the program we got going, and if the end results of those programs is not to put families back together, we don't understand what it means. See, the church is to be the big family. This is the family of God. And then we are supposed to reach out and gather other families unto us. And then we are supposed to be nurturing families. That's our work. That's the work of the church. It's nurturing families within neighborhoods and communities. That's the word. That's why we call it Christian community development. We're talking about a geographical location. We're talking about six or eight blocks or ten blocks around the church. It should be our target area for development. We're talking about a community where we can put families back together. That was his task. And so he confronted them. He confronted our um, uh, Ahab there. And then of course uh, when the news got to Jezebel what had happened. I mean Jezebel they got to Jezebel and 
I'm missing a point I want to make. Even though he confronted the king, he never stopped loving the king. That's why I don't like the way uh, Russ Limbaugh and them quite do the president. And I don't like the way we do it. Now, I know the president, I said yesterday morning, have sinned. That he's done wrong. And he is not a good example of what we want our children to be. But on the other hand, you're not supposed to ridicule. You're supposed to keep on loving him. Because it's only love that can bring people back to the kingdom. We're going to see this guy after he kills the prophet. And after the rain starts, you know what happened? He go out and go to the king and he get in front of the king and he run back all those miles with the king's chariot, making certain that the king got back in to the palace saved. That's important. That's important. And so he got there. But Jezebel didn't care for all of that. She put out there and a hit on him. And she said that by tomorrow this time, uh, he's going to be just like one of those prophets. And when the word got back to Elijah, he was still a vulnerable guy. And he started running. But the Bible says this. Now, you got to listen to that carefully. Got to read your Bible carefully. God gave him the strength to escape. Yes. He went, God fed him, and then he went in the strength of the food that God provided for him as he plead, went to the cave. Yeah. I'm going to have to bring this message here to a close, but this is the point I want you to make. Not only did this man, Elijah, was vulnerable in confronting the king, confronting the false prophets. Now, let me tell you, you'd ask the question, who are the false prophets today? Who are the false prophets that we want to refer to that? Well, the false prophet today is as much of a system as it is individuals. Let's keep that in mind. We, we are wrestling not against flesh and blood today, but we are wrestling against principalities. We are wrestling against a media system. It is this media system. It is these televangelists. It is these talk show hosts. It is these sterns. It is these uh, talk shows. And they have set the standard of morality. And the standard of morality today is the one that gets the most laughs. Today. And so that's how false. And I want you to know, it's many of it is our false TV evangelists. So called this, this name it and claim it is the eve of one. And what Tom Sign is talking about today, when this depression come, when this recession come, this nation is going to be in a mess. Because we have accepted Jesus today as our primary one to meet our individualistic selfish need. Most of this prayer is for God to meet my need based on my consumer standard that I'm living in. And we are not praying at all that God would provide for us so that we can push his kingdom out there. We're getting God to provide for us in order that we might have the things that we need in society. And this society, this, 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 this name and claim it, this so-called seed faith, this giving in order to get back is false. You don't give to get. You give out of the abundance of what God has blessed you with in our society. I want you to know that you know with all of this evangelism, with all of this so-called uh, uh, talk about God in our society, do you know that these people are setting the stage for these lotteries? Wow. Because they're giving us that good luck charm. They, 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 they got us playing the lottery. They, 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 we, and we're turning God into a lottery. Why is all these counties and states are getting these lotteries going? It's because the Christians have been tuned for taking a chance. 
There are people even praying that they might hit the lottery so they can give some more money to God. You hear that kind of stuff that we are faced with today. And our society is saturated with that. That's the false prophet we have today. Now, most people are not willing to confront these false prophets because those are where the churches are growing the fastest. These churches are growing the fastest. And it's raking, it's really just sort of compounding the misery of the black community. Because this young black middle class that are making forty and fifty thousand dollars a year got three cars and all these notes and they need to be praying they think in order to pay their bills and rent in our society and they have very little to give to God in our society what's going to happen it's going to be a disaster it's going to be a disaster when it happens because we are all set up for it let me conclude then what should we be doing what should we be doing let me tell you the last story I got to tell. The last story about Elijah, because I want to tell this one. Elijah gets to the cave, and then when he gets there, he's tired, and God let him take a nap. <laughs> and then God talks to him again. And he talks to Elijah. He takes care of him. He nurtures him, takes care of him. And then he says to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? <laughs> what are you doing hiding out here in this cave? Yeah, right. You know, he just run all these miles to get away from Jezebel. He said, what on earth are you doing in this cave? <laughs> now nah, I love Elijah. Know what he says? Know what he says? He says to God, he hears the voice of God. He says, God, I'm here because I love you. He says, everybody has to turn against you. And he said, I love you. And look, I'm here because I went out and I confronted the king. I went out and I confronted the prophet. I'm here because I love you. I love you. And then God let him take another nap. <laughs> and then God said to him, I'm going to show myself to you. And so God sent a... Uh, an earthquake and Elijah listened to hear God he didn't hear him he sent a terrible wind he didn't hear God he sent lightning flashing he didn't hear God and then he was down in the cave and he heard this small voice and then what happened then, he hears this small voice. Then I know, he knows God. This is why I like this guy. He knows God. And here, this guy comes out of the cave. And he comes out of the cave in order to get as close as he could to God. He wraps his robe over his face. Because he knows that if he get too close to God, if he see God's face, he's going to die. But he, he's ready to move out towards this God. Because he loved God. And God speaks to him again, and he says, why are you here? Why are you here? And Elijah says the same thing. <laughs> he said, I'm here because I love you. Look, if we're going to do the will of God, the first requirement is that we got to love God. Amen. We got to love God more than the program we have. Amen. We got to love God. That's the requirement. It's a love I got. And then concluded. God says, oh, okay, I have 7,000 people out there who haven't bowed, and I want you to go out and educate them. I want you to go out and start a school of the prophets. I want you to go out there and teach them. Now, if we're going to help people, we got to get an environment where we can teach people the word of God. All of, again, we need to be doing all that we are doing in CCDA. But we need to be not only, we need to be having tent meetings. We need to be having street meetings. We need to be out in the streets reaching our people. And then we need to create environments where we can teach these young folks the word of God. And so he went out and said, now, I want you to go and I want you to make, you make him a kingmaker. 
because he was so obedient, God makes him a kingmaker. He said, I want you to go up to Syria, and I want you to anoint a king up there. I want you to go down to Israel, I want you to anoint a king there. And then I want you to go and get you a helper to replace you. I want you to get you a capable helper. And you know what he went? He went and he got uh, Elisha. And this time, you know, Elijah was a wealthy guy. I guess y'all know that, don't you? Not only was Eli, well, Elisha wealthy, but Elijah, Elisha was well educated. And so he went and got, because here this guy is out there plying, and he got 12 other people plying with 12 other yokes of oxen, and they all belong to him. <laughs> then, but when Elijah put his robe around him, he gave those oxen up. In fact, he went home and killed those oxen, took the plows and made an offering, uh, uh, sacrifice, and for a feast for all of his other friends. That's what Jesus was talking about when Jesus said, if any person put his hands to the plow, looking back, is not fit for the kingdom of God, he's talking about Elisha. He's talking about Elisha. Elisha who left it all. Left his father, all of his wealth, everything, and followed Elisha, e Elijah. That's what God wants us to do. That's what God wants some of us middle class black folks to do. To give up something. And you know a few of them is doing it. A few of them is doing it. A few of them is giving it up. It's giving it up. Fear me and I is talking about it all the time. We are giving it up. We are cashing in our insurance policy. We done went past our retirement so we can cash that in. And when we can, we are older than retirement. <laughs> you, you know, we can cash that in. God is calling on us as people to invest something into his, into his kingdom. Well, my time is gone. Let me just say, what can we do? We have to take a few minutes this morning. What can we do? What can y'all do individually? What can we do individually? Number one is that we've got to get us a, a philosophy of living, an individual philosophy. And I call my philosophy of living something I call the three P's. Let's write those down, the three P's. The first P is that you've got to live with a sense of purpose. Purpose, purpose. You've got to find your purpose. Right now, I know the way I'm going to live the remainder of my life. I know that. I got a purpose for living. You got to find your purpose. That's important. Then once you get purpose, you will get number two, you'll get passion. 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 We need passion. We need to be able, I love when these guys come up to this platform and start teaching and start crying. I like to see them break up. <laughs> I like to see people be more concerned about other people and about what they're involved in than they're concerned about themselves in life. That's what Gordy was talking about last night. Gordy was talking about trying to do the will of God. He wanted to know what is the will of God and that is where the pain comes. And he was willing to do that pain. So your passion. And number three, third P, it must be for people. Whatever we're doing, we must be doing it for people. And that's why I can listen again to this prosperity stuff. Most of this stuff is for machinery. Most of this stuff is for other stuff. Most of this stuff is not, most of this press stuff is not for people. What we ought to be praying for is people. What we ought to be concerned about is people. If we, God is going to meet some needs, there should be some needs, so we can use that to rescue people. And then thirdly, we must be doing it fourthly. We must be doing it for the praise of God's glory. Boy, I'm telling you, every time when somebody, even in CCDA, when I hear somebody say, I ask, how your program going? And they say, oh, we are having problems. And I say, what is people doing? Letting their ego hang out? <laughs> I want you to know ego pride is the Satan incarnated in people. Wow. And most of our problems is ego pride. We are not doing what we are doing for the glory of God. We are doing it to exalt ourselves. I meet all these young capable of black folks. And they're saying, I'm on my career track. Their career track 
is more important than the will of God. Elisha was on a career track. He had his big farm going. He left that career track to follow the will of God. And so we need people today to give up that career. Give it up. Give it up. And turn your life over to God. Or take that skill that you have learned in that career and turn it over to God. Okay, they got the stop sign on me. Come on, my dear. And, uh, <laughs>